I used to walk my mother to work every morning. And then when I get to the job where she worked, I would always uh, bring in coal and wood and make fire. Well, I came from a large family. Uh, I had five brothers and two sisters. I served in the Marine Corps from 1942 to 1945. Who was going to the Marine? There was four of us. We were all drafted at the same time. So we decided to take the Marine because we wanted to fight. They came all, from all across the country to take up the challenge to become United States Marines. They went through arduous training at Montfort Point, which is now today Camp Johnson. They had to deal with the tough drill instructors and also the racial inequalities that they faced on a day-to-day -day basis in Jacksonville, North Carolina. You couldn't eat uptown. You couldn't go to the uh, uh, restaurants with white. You couldn't ride on the bus with white. And uh, it was a... Uh, and when I learned how precious it really was, I was in Jacksonville, North Carolina. I was 18 years old. I, I picked the Marines out because uh, they were just, just started taking black in the Marine Corps. So I was among the first. I was in the 19th platoon. We only had five, seven guys there was over 18 years old in our platoon. All the rest of them was 18 years old and left. And you know, you won't believe this, but a man 25 years old and one 18 years old makes a lot of difference when we out training. I've had the opportunity to meet several Montfort Point Marines while serving as a school first sergeant at Camp Johnson from 2008 to 2009. Many of them attended the events that the command hosted during African American History Month, and many of them were extremely proud to see senior African American officers and senior enlisted Marines. I didn't realize that they had two or three different young, I mean, say in the Marines. Yeah. And when the guy told, and when uh, Colleen said, Charlie said, why don't you go down there tonight so you can meet the young? I said, they got a black young down there, I'm going down there and meet him. I said, I want to meet him. Yeah. I said, 66 years later. 66 years later. 66 years later. Although these men endured the hardships, they still fought honorably and served their country. And today, they still serve as shining examples to all Marines. Once a Marine, always a Marine. So that's what I stayed, that's what I am now. And he said, if anything ever happened to me, he said, remember to protect each other, whatever you do. He said, I don't want nothing to happen to you guys. He said, God, you all belong to me. He said, I'm going to look out for you. Excuse me. They were among the nation's first black Marines who came from the North and South to train when the country was sharply divided along racial lines. Because of your color, and only because of your color, you had to go segregated places. You, you go to the movie, you had to go upstairs or, or sit in some corner someplace. If you wanted to buy food, you had to go around to a little window 
and, uh, and they might get around to taking care of you if you stayed there long enough after you've served all the white. Despite the racial tension, 88-year-old Oscar Culp says he would blaze the trail again if it improved the plight of black folks. You think back of the time that you went through so that you could have the same freedom as everybody else, that, that really, that was, that was, a, was a disaster really. From 1942 to 1949, approximately 20,000 African-American men joined the Marine Corps. They got their boot camp training at Montford Point near Jacksonville, North Carolina, a segregated camp of wooden cardboard huts where they braved a variety of threats from the swagger sticks of tough drill instructors to snakes, mosquitoes, even bears. In many cases, they were challenged a lot harder than their white counterparts entering the Corps at the same time. George Mitchell spent 32 years in the Marines, serving under 15 generals. I've had good duty, I've had bad duty, and I've had unpleasant duty. Although Mitchell was promoted several times, he never made the rank of officer. But yet, I knew how to cope with the bad duty. I knew how to do the, the good duty. I knew how to do it well enough to know that this bird over here who's a bird and he's not doing it right, hey, hey, give the job to Mitch. He'll get it done. And you know, and I said, hey, so that's the way the system works. I said, you don't have to be white to, to, to get it done. I said, you can be black and do it. I said, but you don't have room for mistake. The Montford Point Marines didn't make many mistakes. They served during a critical point in our history, fighting in some of the bloodiest struggles in the Pacific, Saipan, Iwo Jima, and Okinawa, Japan. Some died, but many others continued to serve in Korea and Vietnam. Now, 70 years after they entered the Corps, the Montford Point Marines were finally rewarded this summer with the Congressional Gold Medal, the nation's highest civilian honor. When Mitchell and Culp enlisted in the Marines in 1942, there were no black officers. Today, there are several black generals in the Corps, not to mention a black commander-in-chief. All thanks to the Montford Pointers, who paved the way for other minorities and women, too. And every time I see, a, you know, a, a, a general, especially a colonel, you know, I, I just say, well, well, we, we, we did all right. Mm -hmm. we, we did all right, yes. Mm -hmm. I feel good. Mm -hmm. On June 25th, 1941, President Roosevelt issued Executive Order 8802, establishing the fair employment by the armed forces. From 1942 to 1949, a few brave African-American men changed the face of the United States Marine Corps forever. Faced with many challenges, they set out to make a difference and ended up making history. Listen as three Montford Point Marines share a personal story of honor, courage, and commitment. My name is Robert D. Reed, served 26 years in the Corps from 1948 till 1974. The reason why I joined the Marine Corps was because at the time, there was a draft, and when I graduated from high school, my buddies and I said, let's find out what the military is all about. Collectively, we said, let's do the Marine Corps. They seem to be some pretty tough guys. Now, we had joined. We weren't drafted. We joined the Marine Corps. They never told us that we were going to a separate boot camp. Well, the first couple of weeks was pure hell. <laughs> my drill instructor, he was the one that told us that if you're going to be a black Marine, you're going to have to be better than anybody else. Better. Subjected to very intense training, Reed and his fellow Montford Point Marines endured the hardships of boot camp, pushing them to limits most Marines had never experienced. Well, the thing is, after my tour was up, I came back to the States, and it just so happened that the Marine Aviation wanted to get blacks into their ranks. And I was one of the first blacks to go into Marine Aviation as an enlisted man and my time in aviation wasn't until I got out of the Marine Corps. Not only did the Montford Point Marines open doors, but they helped to set a precedent of courage for today's African-American Marines. The Marine Corps was the last military service to be uh, integrated. 
And I think that was the beginning of a new era of the Marine Corps. The Muffet Point Marines are extremely important. They were strong enough to take on a challenge that seemed to be insurmountable at that particular time. And for them, uh, I do serve. My name is Jean Dowdy. I was born in Stamford, Connecticut. I was uh, really appointed by the Navy Department to serve in the Marines seven months after the uh, famous uh, 8802 presidential proclamation allowed us to go into the Marine Corps. So I was one of the original pioneers. Marfa Point Camp was a segregated camp. We felt the indignity that was thrown at us, but we had to learn, we had to face all of these challenges that we had. Shortly after graduating from boot camp, Gene Dowdy's typical duties as an admin clerk shifted as the Commandant began increasing the responsibilities of African-American Marines in the war campaign. We ended up on the island of Iwo Jima. I landed on D-Day, incidentally, with uh, a few ammunition companies and depot companies. It was very unpleasant. But I, uh, I prevailed. I was glad to be in the Marine Corps, and I'm glad that I was uh, honorably discharged. But going into the military service, I would consider, again, very gainful and a real true benefit. The legacy of the Montford Point Marines, much like the famed 54th Infantry Regiment and the Tuskegee Airmen, is significant in the history of America and its armed forces. I think it's something that uh, a lot of people need to hear. Um, to appreciate what, what they've actually done and to appreciate the opportunity that they created. Charles O. Foreman. I joined the Marine Corps because I happen to be one of those people who does not like to be drafted. If I've got to do something, I like to do it on my own. I was uh, ordered to go to Jacksonville, North Carolina, Monford Point. My experience in the uh, boot camp was very typical. During Foreman's time at the Montford Point camp, conditions were tough as they were forced to build and live in wooden huts surrounded by the heavily rugged Jacksonville, North Carolina terrain. After boot camp, the war in the Pacific was, was of course proceeding and what was created was what they call the First Colored Replacement Battalion. And this was a group of uh, men, I believe it was about 100 in the group. At that time, I think I had been promoted to a three-stripe sergeant and I was responsible for all these people. We sailed out of San Diego to uh, Oahu. While there, I carried the title of Acting First Sergeant. Well, we actually stayed there for the duration of the war. If you ask me the question if I had it to do over again, yes, I would do it over again. Being in the Marine Corps helped because it gave me the backbone not to accept what was handed down. If you get want something, you better stand up and fight for it. Today, there are thousands of African-American Marines serving in all fields and in every occupational specialty of the Marine Corps. If a month for Point Marine walked up to me today, um, I would say thank you. Uh, thank you for paving the way. Thank you for creating an opportunity uh, for myself and my brothers in arms that's come before me and those that have come after me. The spirit of our Corps, embodied in the Eagle Globe and Anchor, lives within the soul of every Marine. This spirit is born through an arduous rite of passage at boot camp and officer training, after which a young man or woman is called a United States Marine for the first time. Our ethos has been shaped by ordinary men and women, patriots who showed extraordinary leadership and courage, both physical and moral. From 1942 to 1949, Approximately 20,000 African-American men enlisted in the Marine Corps at a time when our nation was at war and the country and military services were resistant to integration. They came from the North and from the South, from all walks of life. They came for different reasons. Some wanted the challenge of being a Marine, some wanted to earn a living, but all came to protect and serve their country honorably. 
They arrived on a rugged and heavily wooded five and a half acre site near Jacksonville, North Carolina called Montford Point. The first group of these pioneering Marines built the now famous camp of wooden huts. Others that followed fell in on their handiwork. They braved a variety of threats, everything from the swagger sticks of tough drill instructors to the snakes and the mosquitoes, and even those bears that inhabited the land. In many cases, they were challenged harder than their white counterparts, entering the Corps at the same time. These brave Marines served with honor during a critical period in our nation's history, fighting in some of the bloodiest struggles in the Pacific, Saipan, Iwo Jima, and Okinawa. Some died in these epic island battles. Many others continued their service in the colds of Korea and the jungles of Vietnam. Many Montford Point veterans, men like Gilbert Hashmark Johnson, Edgar Huff, and Frederick C. Branch, are now legends in the rich history of the Marine Corps. In 19 June of 1942, I saw a newspaper article to the effect that the Marine Corps had begun accepting Negroes for service with the Corps. Well, you know, you can't uh, think of being Marine without thinking about the Marfa Pointers because they are the beginning. Um, you often question yourself, could I have done that? Could I have had the perseverance to come and to join an organization, first, that didn't want you, two, that had the history of being the last service to, do, to integration? The Marine Corps, basically, in the early days, were looking for the best black men that they could find. Four corners of the country. Uh, we had men coming in, uh, who had their degrees. Some had both their degrees and had a couple of years in vocation. We call them the mighty platoon. We knew we were being trained harder. And of course, the DIs would tell us that uh, you know, they're gonna make us superior to all, all of the other of white Marines, particularly. In fact, as a matter of fact, we were breaking every record that they ever had because they pushed us to the end of our endurance to where we just couldn't go any further. You think about where they came and why they came. Uh, many of them were doing just fine where they are. Some were educators, uh, some were professional ball players, some even owned their own business. Some were farmers, and some were just working in factories. But they came because they felt in their heart of hearts that our nation needed their support, needed them to be a part of what was good about America. And a lot of them felt that when they came, when they provided their contributions, that somehow that they would convince the world as well as America that they had earned the right to all of the rights and privileges there are being Americans. I went in, in late enough and we had all uh, white officers, but we had black drill instructors. Hatchbuck Johnson was, was much older than, than we were. He had spent about three tours in the Army, and he came and he had about two tours in the Navy. And that's, that's how he got to be called Hashbach. He got to serve here, earn service stripes. So he had about three of them, I think. Hashbach was uh, a very strong disciplinarian. In contrast, Huff was uh, about twice the size of Hashbach. And Huff was a big guy. And whereas Hashbach would issue uh, stern disciplinary kinds of uh, orders, Huff would uh, walk up to you softly and knock you on the, on the deck if you didn't comply. I left home to join the Marine Corps, and uh, when I joined the Marine Corps, when I got to uh, Mumford Point, I had 25 cents in my pocket, that's all I had. In the last suit, I uh, had it on, and uh, I came to the Marine Corps to stay. Uh, Huff was strictly a, one on the D.I. and he was a tough guy, tall, big, and strong. And so when he spoke to you, you moved. You, you, you didn't dare say anything, because you know, like I said, you were at his mercy. As I said, they could do anything they wanted to do, and they did. The Marine Corps today is much better than it was for, for the minority. I see sergeants, majors, I see uh, generals, colonels. When I got out of the Marine Corps, it was only one lieutenant. Remember when they came in, there was no black officers at all. Matter of fact, when Fred Branch in 1945 was the first African American commissioned, 
he, that one of the stipulations that he had to come from the Montfort Point Marines. But I always look at the photograph of Fred receiving his uh, second lieutenant commission, the big smile on his face and his lovely lady beside him. Uh, I have a pretty good idea what Fred went through, but I have no idea what his personal experiences were. Given the times, I just have to assume that Fred caught hell. Now we've got Jones with three stars, so that's a big change. And then myself, when I, when I went as a, as a private, I never had any concept that we'd ever have a black officer, and yet I became one of them. Uh, there's no question. I, especially after I had an opportunity to meet them and become a part of them and be mentored by them, that when you listen to their stories of their struggles and the things that they did, and more particularly the things that they did to overcome adversity, they were all tools that I put in my kit bag. And, uh, and as I came up, as I matured through the Marine Corps and encountered some of the similar things that they did, but nothing, nothing at all close to what they had been through in the 40s. Um, you know, I would remember things that they said, things they did, uh, and use it in, 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 to help me. The, one of the things they taught me was, you know, if you're focused on your mission, if you know what you want to do, uh, nobody can stop you from doing that. So you, you want to think that when you step into the footsteps of these giants and the legacy for which they have left you, that you measure up. And so that's, that inspiration is beyond words. Um, because of what they have done as a part of that fabric of the creating America history. And they tell me <laughs> that they're climbing up on my shoulders, but they did the work. They did the work. And I'm very proud of them. It's the responsibility of the Marine Corps to anchor the story of Montford Point in the annals of the Marine Corps' rich history. Every Marine, from private to general, should know the history of the Montford Point Marines, who crossed the threshold to fight not only the enemy they were to know overseas, but that of racism and segregation in their very own country. Collectively, they paved the way for the many thousands of Marines of various backgrounds, men and women alike, who serve our nation today with honor, courage, and commitment. Bet your life it was. Marine Corps boot camp was an eye-opening experience for Edgar Law. That's where I first felt that there was something different between the races. But Von Whitworth well, knew actually, better. I did not have any uh, adverse thoughts about it because uh, I grew up in North Carolina. And I, I was familiar with, you know, the way things work. So uh, it really didn't affect me one way or the other. Still, segregation was new to Northerners like Leroy Pittman. When we got to Washington, D.C., the train conductor put us up in the front, up near the smoke uh, engine. And uh, that's when I realized, you know, that uh, things were beginning to change uh, because I was separated from the white boys that I traveled with. These men were there, just like Jack McDowell. On the base, uh, they were all black guys. It wasn't a problem until I graduated from boot camp and had to leave the base. That base was called Montford Point, a small segregated camp on Camp Lejeune, North Carolina, where 19,000 black recruits went to boot camp from 1942 to 1949. They wanted me to become a steward. And I said, I didn't join the Marine Corps to be a steward. I came to fight Japanese. And they said, you're going to steward school. I said, aye, aye, sir. Went to steward school. Of course, we all flunked out on purpose. And they sent us overseas to Okinawa. We got there two weeks before they dropped the bombs on Japan. I felt when I finished boot camp that if my officer had told me to attack a tank with a toothpick, I would have done it because I felt I could defeat that tank. That was the thing that carried me through life. And life went on for them in the years after Montford Point, but not without each other. Big firefight. No way to get out. My company was, you know, we rear guard for the whole battalion. Out of nowhere comes these tanks. 
and Persan sitting on top. He got us out of there. He gave me the finger as he went by. <laughs> but he got us out of there. If it wasn't for him, I wouldn't be here today. It's a good thing he is. After 70 years, McDowell, along with 300 of his fellow Montfort Point Marines, is here at the U.S. Capitol to receive the Congressional Gold Medal. It's Congress's highest honor, bestowed upon these men in recognition for breaking the Marine Corps color barrier a quarter century before the Civil Rights Movement. People never knew I was in the Marine Corps because I don't brag about that. But uh, it's something that I'm very proud of myself. And this day, above all others in my life, is the crowning glory. I really appreciate what has happened. It's the, one of the best days of my life. And I'm really proud to be a Marine. It's a long time coming, and it, it just overwhelms me, you know, that this has come to pass. And I'm glad that I'm still here to see it happen. To me, the greatest story is the transition that took place over the years, up until now, and all the good things that have happened as a result of that. Um, and, and that's what I think the medal should represent. You know, not the bad times, but all the good times that have followed some 60 years after that. From Washington, I'm Sergeant Todd Hunter. In many societies, including our own, military service in support of national defense is considered a responsibility of citizenship. But even in our own country, not all of our citizens have been able to fulfill this responsibility. Today, the United States Marine Corps is fully racially integrated, but it wasn't always this way. The history of blacks in the Marine Corps started during the American Revolution in 1776. According to surviving Western payrolls, there were at least three black men enlisted in the Continental Marines and ten others who served as Marines in state navies. But afterwards, discrimination kept blacks out of the Marine Corps for over 160 years. They had to earn the right to fight. By World War II, most of the United States had laws of some kind requiring segregation of the races. Living under so-called Jim Crow segregation laws prohibited intermarriage and required that blacks have separate facilities for travel, lodging, eating and drinking, schooling, worship, housing, and other aspects of social and economic life. Failure to obey such rules could lead to arrest and imprisonment. For many African Americans, it was, a, it was a world of boundaries and laws and strictures that dictated everything from where you could go to get a ham sandwich or a cold drink to where you could live, where you could worship, where you could educate your children, and people had to be aware of that at all times. The Army was segregated, all blacks in the Navy served as messmen, and the Marine Corps followed a simple policy. It had not accepted blacks since it was formally established and would not now. Major General Thomas Holcomb, Commandant of the Corps, stated boldly in April 1941 that the Negro race has every opportunity now to satisfy its aspirations for combat in the Army, and said, if it were a question of having a Marine Corps of 5,000 whites or 250,000 Negroes, I would rather have the whites. Black leaders, including the NAACP, were intensively lobbying the Roosevelt administration to end discrimination in the defense industry. Under pressure, President Roosevelt issued Executive Order 8802, banning discrimination in the defense industries and federal government. But the Marine Corps continued to resist. Yesterday, December 7, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. The United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire 
of Japan. The black press was focusing on tying the war to the continued struggle for civil rights. A letter published in the Pittsburgh Courier on January 31, 1942, posed the dilemma by asking, should I sacrifice my life to live half American? And urged colored Americans to adopt the double V for double victory. The first V for victory over our enemies from without, the second V for victory over our enemies from within. The beginning of the war and the need to enlist as many Americans as possible put more pressure on the Marine Corps to recruit African Americans. General Holcomb was overruled. Six months after Pearl Harbor, the Corps announced that it was organizing a racially segregated defense unit of about 900 men in an isolated training camp called Montford Point, claiming that an integrated camp would be militarily inefficient. For many of these Marines, the trip to Montford Point in the deeply segregated South was the first time they experienced life under discriminatory laws. Well, when we came on the bus I was on, there were only 15 of us. And that 15 had to sit in the back of the bus. There was nobody else on the bus but us. So that was an indication there. When I got off the bus in Montford Point, I was met by my DA, drill instructor. And that was a real eye-opening experience as to what I was going to be facing. The black men that enlisted in the Marines to fight for their country had hopes that their service would have a greater purpose. I think if I could put myself in their mind, I think they were really just really trying to make progression for their rights, for their equal rights. And they, a lot of them felt that, um, you know, if I go and fight for this country, maybe once I come back, they will see or treat me differently and treat me equal to all. Training at Montford Point was tough designed to break the men down and build them back into a cohesive unit. In fact, training at Montford Point was made harder due to the conditions of the camp, with cardboard Quonset huts, weed-filled parade grounds, and poorly fitted uniforms, and the black drill instructors who eventually took over. At first, all of Montford Point's officers, non-commissioned officers, and drill instructors were white, and chosen for their service in the Philippines, Nicaragua, and the Caribbean, which was considered as experience with so-called colored troops. By late 1943, the white staff had chosen and trained recruits to replace the original drill instructors. The black DIs at Montford Point were even tougher because they knew that failure was not an option. One of these DIs was a former Navy man, Gilbert Hashmark Johnson, whom the men particularly disliked for his harsh treatment. But the black drill instructors were tougher on them than the white drill instructors. And you know, so you have these mixed opinions and mixed thoughts about that because you understand the mindset of the black drill instructors, okay, if we have to prove that we have the right to fight, we're going to be better than any other Marine that are, that's out there. So vice just meeting the standard, they were pushing them to go above that bar. But the tough training paid off. In places like the Mariana Islands, Saipan, Tinian, Guam, Peleleu, Iwo Jima, Okinawa, Japan, and China, the Montford Point Marines served honorably throughout World War II. But overshadowing all of that success was segregation. The majority of the black Marines were put into service units, supplying ammunition and hauling supplies. Only two battalions were placed into combat roles, but only where the white marines had already been to hold down controlled areas. But, when these marines were sent into battle to supply ammunition, they picked up the guns of their fallen comrades and started fighting. After hearing of the heroism of the African American enlisted men, Lieutenant General Alexander A. Vandegrift, Commandant of the Marine Corps, replacing General Holcomb, announced, The Negro Marines are no longer on trial. They are Marines. Period. The hard-fought battle for equal rights of the Marine Corps by the men of Montford Point finally paid out in 1948 when President Harry S. Truman signed Executive Order 9980 in 1981, ending discrimination in the federal government hiring and bringing equality of treatment and opportunity into the armed forces. 
between 1942 and 1949, more than 20,000 men were trained at Montford Point. But the end of segregation in the Marine Corps resulted in the deactivation of Montford Point in 1949. In 1974, Montford Point was renamed Camp Gilbert H. Johnson in honor of the late Sergeant Major Gilbert H. Hashmark Johnson. The Montford Point Marines left a huge legacy and a sense of patriotism for African Americans to come after them. But it's a special kind of patriotism to, to show your devotion to a country that doesn't treat you well. To love a country that doesn't necessarily love you back. That's a special kind of patriotism. And I think that later generations, if they really understand the, um, the contributions of these men and women and the, the grit that they demonstrated, but more importantly, the grace that they demonstrated, that offers tremendous lessons for all of us. Over 67 years after World War II had ended on June 27, 2012, the Marines of Montford Point were awarded the Congressional Gold Medal for acts of valor in three major wars, World War II, the Korean War, and the Vietnam War. Over 19,000 black Marines were trained at Montford Point. As of June 27, 2012, only 368 survived to receive this honor. It serves as a symbol honoring the legacy of the black Marines who earned the right to fight.